The story you're about to see was produced through the passion of Cone Health caregivers. It demonstrates how patients' lives are changed in the midst of their dreams and best laid plans. You will see how our patient experience is truly created by exceptional caregivers. The following film was created by a small but resourceful team that included a nurse tech with a camera and an intern whose mother shared this same battle with cancer. It's a story about caregiving as captured by actual caregivers. As such, it values TLC over HD, and we hope it touches you as it's touched us. pinpoint it um, aside from just he's a good egg that was how my mom described him um, he had a good soul uh, I remember several times you know leading a, our engagement was a shock I will yeah, I was surprised he pulled it off so it didn't take me long actually at all um, I probably could have proposed a lot sooner than I did well the wedding was an intimate affair of close to 200 people up at uh, Autumn Creek Vineyards in Mayadan, North Carolina. And he uh, took me to meet the world as Mrs. Mike Kilpatrick in the bucket of the John Deere tractor. Um, so it was wonderful. It was perfect. It was, it was absolutely perfect. I mean, I think we both floated through that wedding like she floated in on that tractor. I really think we did from start to finish. We were getting ready to leave to go to Costa Rica, and we had this amazing trip that Mike had planned, and he had he had kept it a surprise that was completely, you know, his gift to me was this amazing adventure in Costa Rica. In our flight from Costa Rica, first stop was, was Houston. Um, we had been delayed in leaving Costa Rica. And I just remember standing up um, on that plane and I looked at Mike and I, I, I felt something. And I remember like, as we're walking off the plane, I remember just looking down and that's when I could start seeing the blood. I don't really know the female anatomy very well. I thought it was a very bad menstrual cycle. And no harm, no foul, go to the OB and get something taken care of and everything will be fine. In, our, in that moment, I don't know why we didn't go get help, um, you know, I was losing a lot of blood. Well, we received a, a, a rather urgent phone call from her OBGYN, Dr. Tavon, uh, letting us know that this young lady had presented to his office, that she was bleeding a lot, that he had controlled the bleeding, could we possibly see her the next day? And of course, we accommodated that, and we're lucky to have a GYN oncologist here, Dr. Wendy Brewster, who saw her that day. And, you know, Nancy was the first person that that came to meet us. You know, first thing, you know, my name is Nancy. Um, you know, I, I'm i here, I'm, I'm gonna take care of y'all. Dr. Tavon declined to take a biopsy because he knew it would bleed a good bit. And uh, so when Laura and her husband Mike came to the office, we knew that that's what we were gonna be doing, doing a biopsy. We knew there was a potential for it to bleed. Immediately, the bleeding starts again. And unfortunately, when the speculum goes in to look, Laura has a very large cervical tumor. It's sort of remarkable since just a, six or so months prior, she had had a normal exam prior to becoming married. I mean, it was intense bleeding. I think at one point, Dr. Brewster, she guesstimated that I'd lost something like seven liters of blood. I honestly, cancer never crossed my mind. The scan that I had just had showed a mass on my cervix. It was five and a half centimeters in diameter, and it was malignant, and it was a very rare and aggressively growing tumor. Um, you know, and I think at, at that moment, um, and at that moment, I didn't hear you have cancer. Um, what I heard, and what she would, you know, then go on to say was, you know, your ability to carry a baby and have a baby is gone. Um, you're going to be losing that. Well, 
on the very first date that we go out to dinner and we're eating dinner and I asked her randomly, do you want to have kids? And it was almost across like, do you want to have kids right now? I mean, it shocked her in a way. And so from that point on, I think she knew, and that's probably what made it very tough for her. I, I personally, I love kids. I could have one yesterday um, and she could as well. And so I think it, from her standpoint, she felt really bad for me. And from my standpoint, I felt really bad for her. So how do we get the surgery scheduled? When do we schedule it? Who is the surgery scheduled with? Who's the best? And I, I remember Nancy coming in and Nancy had said, you know, Jane, the best is here in Greensboro and the best is Dr. Clark Pearson. Um, he wasn't able to do the surgery. Uh, he was either traveling or he wasn't back in, in Greensboro for another two weeks. And, you know, two weeks was a really long time. You know, Nancy's sitting at the, on the right side of the bed with, with my mom and she looked at her and, you know, she's holding my hand and she's, you know, she's focusing on my mom and she said, Jane, if it were my daughter, I would wait four weeks if it meant that Dr. Clark Pearson would do the surgery. He's the best and he's that good. And, um, I mean, he was. And the type of surgery that Laura needed is rather, it requires a great deal of expertise. And I knew that if I myself needed to have a radical hysterectomy, it would be Dr. Clark Pearson that did it. If I needed brain surgery, he'd have to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the surgery, uh, it was two weeks later. One of the more emotional moments of that, that time up until then was, you know, when they wheel you out and then all your family is all around you and, you know, Mike was holding my hand and, you know, for him to let go. It was kind of the first time that I felt alone, but I knew I wasn't, like I, I knew that I wasn't, but you know, it was kind of like at that point everything was, you know, out of my, con out of my control. Um, you know, and all of the, the staff and the anesthesiologists, they were all wonderful. So the surgery was the end of June, um, we had all of July to, to get better, August, September. Um, Chemo and radiation was supposed to start at the beginning of October. We would arrive at 9 o'clock in the morning, most mor most Mondays, and have lab work at 9.30. And, you know, I was doing this in October, November, and December. Um, it was cold. I have extremely bony fingers, and I was really hard to get to bleed. So I remember Doug, Sabrina, and CL just being wonderful, you know, because by the time you get you know, to weeks five and six, and your fingers have been pricked countless times, you know, they're sore, and they just, they were always so personal and friendly and chatty and... I think they are an amazing couple, period. With Laura, I mean, I always look forward when I seen her on my list, I knew she was gonna make my day that much brighter. I don't ever remember her being anything other than upbeat and smiling and... You know, just, I kind of looked forward to getting to go see them for labs, even though I knew that the next couple of hours of my day was going to be awful. With surgery, looking back on the surgery, every day after surgery was, it was a little bit better. You were healing. Um, you know, with chemo and radiation, radiation in particular, every day got worse. And, you know, I, that first radiation treatment, same thing with the, the chemo, the first one, it was terrifying. I know I would be totally scared if I was going into a room with a big old machine and I was having to lay there, everyone's leaving me when it's time for me to get my treatment. You know, but I, I, I looked forward to four o'clock. Um, the team on the True Bean machine, um, you know, Michelle and Jennifer and Katera, Seth, um, Melissa, they were incredible. Tony, um, you know, every day I'd come home and I'd have big lipstick kisses on my cheeks. Um, it gave me something to look forward to during the whole day. You know, I knew that between 4 and 4.30 I was going to walk through the doors of, you know, the radiation department and they would all be there. We'd chit-chat, 
We would talk about many things, usually television shows. So they really gave me moments of normal during a time that was so far from normal. You know, the first comment she really said to me was when I, I met her at the elevator for her first day. And she said, I'm going to be known as the girl who was treated for cervical cancer, not the girl with the awesome wedding. So that touched me. You know, that last day of radiation treatment, Mike was with me. And, you know, we're leaving the cancer center. And, you know, this should be the most incredible feeling ever. You know, check this one off. It was the last time I was going to put that X on the calendar. Um, from here on out, every day was going to get better. And I just, I couldn't stop crying. Um, and it, it was a sad day. As happy as it was, it was incredibly sad. I had just, you know, said goodbye to the girls in radiation and they had gifted me with this beautiful Christmas ornament um, that will always go on my tree. And then, you know, just thinking about all of the people that had come to me so much to me. We really get excited when a patient finishes. And we celebrate. We celebrate. <laughs> we laugh and we hug each other and um, we, um, we let them know how wonderful it is that they've completed such a journey. It's, it's an awesome feeling for, of course, for them, but also for us. You know, and I'll, I'll say to them, okay, I know this is not your favorite place, but if you're ever around, if you're ever um, nearby, just stop by and see us. The last time I saw Laura was at that town hall meeting uh, that she spoke about her uh, experience here. I didn't, I didn't know she even remembered my name <laughs> until the town hall meeting, so I was really flattered at that. The first time I was able to hear Laura's story was when she attended one of our morning town hall sessions that we have here at the Cancer Center really touched me that morning. It just changed my whole outlook on the way I even treat my other patients. And I mean, Laura was just absolutely fantastic. I didn't realize everything she had gone through to that day. And I'm a pretty big man, but when I walked out of this auditorium that morning, I was crying. That she just touched and changed my views on everything, my whole attitude about working, to the point that our motto here is we give hope. And I thought about hope. And I came up with it. Card that the employees have is called honoring our patients' expectations. And it made me think every day when a patient comes in here, do I do everything that they expect me to do? But it, it means trying to, to give care to every piece of the, another person or another being that needs it. But this is what we do here. We, we love our patients. Maybe they don't remember my name or they don't remember exactly what I look like, but I hope they just remember that someone cared for them and that someone um, did make a difference. In I think if we had gotten help in Houston, we wouldn't have ended up at Wesley Law. And I don't think I could have imagined, oh, sorry, I, could, I can't imagine being anywhere else. And that's the attitude she came in with, okay, they say I got cancer, but cancer doesn't have me. So, yes, I think she made this place a better place.